My name is Jennifer Matthews. I am the assistant to the city manager here in Cambridge. I'm also serving as the interim executive director of the Cambridge Human Rights Commission, which enforces the city's fair housing ordinance. And I will be moderating today's panel. I wanna thank the panelists and all the members of the public for joining us. We have with us today, Rachel Tannenhaus, the executive director of the Cambridge Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Carolina Almonte, the attorney investigator for the Cambridge Human Rights Commission. Courtney Laban, the housing supervisor with DeNovo Center for Justice and Healing. And Kelly Vieira, the testing coordinator with the Suffolk University Law School's Housing Discrimination Testing Program. Thank you all so much for joining us. So before we switch to talking specifically about fair housing and basic tenant rights, I wanna talk a little bit about the city's Housed in Cambridge Information to Open Doors campaign that this panel series is a part of. This is the second of three panels the city is hosting as part of Housed in Cambridge. Last Tuesday's panel was on affordable housing, understanding options, opportunities, and pathways. Today, we'll be talking about fair housing and basic tenant rights. And next Tuesday, there's going to be a panel on financing options for first time home buyers and home improvements. So that panel will be at the same time next Tuesday, May 4th, and information is available on the city's website for you to register and attend. And like I mentioned, each of the panels is going to be recorded. So if you can't attend in real time, the information will be available on the city's website. Housing in Cambridge, uh, Housed in Cambridge is a year-long multi-department outreach education and information effort organized by the City Manager's Office of the Housing Liaison, the Community Development Department, the Human Rights Commission, and the Department of Human Service Programs Multi-Service Center. The goal of Housed in Cambridge is to centralize the many housing resources that are available in the city and make it easier for residents to access that information and the assistance they need no matter where they are in the spectrum of housing related services that the city and the community its community partners provide. Housed in Cambridge is going to include a social media campaign, an interactive online housing guide and story map, informational materials and additional discussions and trainings on specific housing related topics. So please share all this information with your family, your friends and your neighbors and stay connected through the city of Cambridge website and social media. The Housing Cambridge campaign would also not be possible without the support of the many provider partners in the city who offer affordable housing opportunities, housing related resources, and housing related services. And so I want to thank all of our community partners for their support, both through the panels and the campaign in general. I also want to acknowledge that the Housing Cambridge campaign builds on incredible work that city departments have been doing for many years, and that includes organizing the annual Affordable and Fair Housing Resource Day that's usually held in April. That panel is, uh, this panel is typically part of that day-long event, and this year's virtual panel series is the result of so much hard work by Crystal Rosa with the Human Rights Commission, Emily Solomon with the Community Development Department, and more Penzac, the city manager's housing liaison. So a huge, huge thank you to Crystal, Emily, and Maura for bringing us all here today and for getting the House in Cambridge program um, going this year. We really, really appreciate it. So I wanna talk a little bit about the panel logistics before we turn over to discussion. Our topic again is fair housing and basic tenant rights. The panelists are going to cover common questions like what does fair housing mean? What are some examples of housing discrimination? and what makes a successful tenant and landlord relationship. So I'm now gonna turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves and their agencies and talk a little bit about the type of assistance that they provide for residents. And we'll start with Carolina Alante. Hey, thank you so much, Jennifer. Hi everyone, my name is Carolina Almonte. I'm the attorney investigator for the Cambridge Human Rights Commission. I'm very happy to be here with you all this afternoon. So the Human Rights Commission is a local civil rights enforcement agency for the city of Cambridge's anti-discrimination ordinances. We have two of them, the Fair Housing Ordinance as well as the Human Rights Ordinance. We are located at 51 Inman Street on the second floor, about down the street from City Hall. And overall, our role is to investigate complaints of not just housing discrimination, but also employment discrimination and public accommodations. Um, one thing I ask that you keep in mind is that we act as a neutral investigative agency, which just means that we do not represent either party. So we don't represent the complainant or the person who files a complaint with us 
or the respondent, the person or entity that the complaint is filed against. A few other things, um, there's no cost to file a complaint. Also, you do not need to be represented. You're more than welcome to be represented if you have your own attorney, um, if desired at your own cost, but that's not required to work uh, with the commission. And a few other things, um, for us to uh, accept a complaint for filing, the discriminatory act must have occurred in the city of Cambridge. Um, so if it happens outside of the city, uh, we may have some appropriate referrals that will be able to look into your complaint, but we only have jurisdiction or the ability to accept complaints that take place in the city of Cambridge within six months from the date the complaint is filed. So that means if something happened over a year ago, we likely can't accept your complaint, but later on I'll talk about some other agencies that may be able to help. Um, we are also a substantially equivalent local agency for federal fair housing complaints. So our housing discrimination complaints are dual filed with HUD, um, the federal fair housing agency, if those protected classes are federally recognized. Um, so just the last thing to keep in mind is um, I'll quickly go through the protected classes that are recognized in Cambridge. So we have sex, sexual orientation, race, color, national origin or ancestry, disability, physical or mental, family status, children under 18, religion, military status, age, source of income, including government benefits and marital status. So to file a complaint with us, um, there must be a protected class involved. Um, and Cambridge is great because we recognize more protected classes than are federally recognized. Um, so that's just a, a quick overview of the commission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. We will go now to Courtney Lebon. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Courtney Lebon. I'm the Housing and Disability Supervisor at DeNovo Center for Justice and Healing. DeNovo is a Cambridge-based organization that offers two main types of service. One is that we provide low or no cost psychological counseling to uninsured and underinsured clients. And we have a staff of four counselors and a number of volunteers who are either social workers or psychologists. We also have a legal services program that offers four area of service, family law, domestic violence, immigration, social security, disability law, and housing. And I supervise the housing and disability practices. Our housing practice provides free representation to tenants in Cambridge and in surrounding communities. Due to the COVID-19 crisis, our priority is assisting tenants who either have received a notice to quit or summons and complaint and are facing eviction, tenants who are facing termination of their rental subsidies, or tenants who were denied public housing or housing subsidies. However, historically in other times, we've also provided tenants with advice and assistance on reasonable accommodation requests related to disabilities, repairs needed within their apartments and other housing related issues. Thank you so much, Courtney. And now we'll go to Kelly Vieira. Hello everyone, my name is Kelly Vieira and I'm an attorney and testing coordinator for Suffolk Law School's Housing Discrimination Testing Program, or HDTP. Um, HDTP is a HUD-funded fair housing organization um, where our primary uh, work is that we uh, do discrimination testing, where uh, the e easiest way to understand it is that we send in secret shoppers, so to speak, to um, act as potential renters looking for housing. So we will send folks to uh, look, at per ad uh, look at advertised apartments and uh, determine whether discrimination is happening. Uh, essentially, we send paired groups so that we can compare how um, someone who is not a part of a protected class is treated um, when we also send someone who is part of a protected class. Um, we offer discrimination testing all throughout the state, state of Massachusetts. Um, so whether you're in Cambridge or outside of Cambridge and uh, you, are, you think that you may have been discriminated against when it comes to housing, um, you can reach out to us. Um, we are both able to do discrimination testing, but we also have a sister program within the law school where law students um, under the supervision of a licensed attorney can represent uh, folks who have been discriminated against and we're able to go forward with litigation um, in particular events of discrimination. So uh, you can always reach out to our organization 
Um, I will make sure that our intake line is uh, sent out via email, but also um, if we're not able to assist um, due to our resource, resources or anything like that, we also uh, would refer you to the many other, or other organizations in the state that do similar work. Wonderful, thank you, Kelly. And last but certainly not least, Rachel Tannenhaus. Hi there, I'm Rachel Tannenhaus. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the ADA coordinator for the city of Cambridge and the executive director of the Cambridge Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Um, we do a lot of things, but some of them are related to housing discrimination. Most of what we do involves giving people information and also helping refer them to resources that they need. Uh, that they need. So we are not an enforcement agency and we, are, uh, and, um, we do not have a complaint process um, for housing for that, we generally refer folks uh, to the Human Rights Commission. That having been said, um, we, we love to give people information, trainings, um, people call us, people email us um, about any number of disability related topics. And one of them is housing, housing discrimination and uh, accessible housing, which is a serious issue in this area. Um, and uh, so, we um, we talk we cheerfully talk to anybody. We will talk to tenants. We will talk to uh, landlords and management companies. We have occasionally been known to talk to their attorneys, although we do not provide legal advice. Um, and uh, so we provide information, resource referral. Um, we can we can and do provide trainings. And in fact, we have even done that sometimes as part of settlements, uh, working with the. Um, Cambridge Human Rights Commission that sometimes is part of a, a settlement with, um, with, with a landlord or, or with a business or something like that, they will need additional training on what the law is and what their responsibilities are. And so we'll sometimes come in and do that. Um, we get a lot of calls from folks about housing and housing discrimination, particularly, you know, obviously people with disabilities, family members of people with disabilities we get a lot of calls about uh, service animals and um, emotional support animals and reasonable accommodations in the, um, in, in, you know, someone's apartment or house or that sort of thing. Um, and also about situations where people for disability related reasons may be having difficulty finding a place to live. Um, and sometimes we receive uh, calls from folks whose access needs change. Um, not all of us are born disability fabulous. Some of us, uh, some of us, most disabilities are acquired. And so what happens with, and many disabilities change over time. And so what happens with a lot of people is that the needs they had when they moved into a place are not the ones that they have now. Um, and we, you know, also answer a lot of questions about that. Um, so yes, we are here for folks and we are happy to um, help in any uh, answering questions in any way we can. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel. So we're going to turn now to our discussion topics. We'll have at least two panelists discussing each topic, and then it's going to be open to all the other panelists to continue the discussion if they'd like to do so. Panelists, if I don't call on you for a specific question, but you'd like to add something, please just raise your hand on Zoom and we'll continue the discussion. So we're going to start with our first topic, which is what is meant by fair housing? Um, I believe we're starting with Kelly. Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. So fair housing is basically an umbrella term that covers a lot of things, but essentially what you should understand about fair housing is that it is the rights that you have um, as someone living in the United States that the government has afforded um, to protect your right to fair and equal housing for everyone. Um, something that's important to note about fair housing is that it does protect everyone in the country. Um, something that's uh, often asked is whether undocumented folks are covered by fair housing laws. They are. Um, your documentation or citizen, citizen, citizenship status rather um, is not uh, does not affect your rights under the fair housing laws. Um, so you know, the laws that protect you federally come from um, the civil rights era. The Fair Housing Act was one of the last major federal laws signed into uh, signed into law um, during the civil rights era of the 1960s. And um, that law, the Fair Housing Act, protects you if you are one of seven um, protected classes, which are race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, which is usually what uh, the presence of children, and national origin. 
Um, those are the seven protected classes that you're protected federally, but Massachusetts also has a series um, of protected classes on top of the seven, um, which I believe uh, Carolina had mentioned um, as part of something that Cambridge focuses on, but the entire state of Massachusetts does also protect these additional classes. Thank you, Kelly. And Carolina, would you like to add some there about what is meant by fair housing? Sure, I think Kelly stated it um, perfectly. I'll just add that, you know, the way I view fair housing is ultimately is to ensure access for everyone. Um, you know, many groups of people have been blocked from access to housing and it's not lost on us that there's still many ongoing issues today. So even though there are many federal, state and local fair housing laws, including our Cambridge ordinance, um, you know, there's a lot of ongoing problems. And, you know, that's why organizations such as our Human Rights Commission work to give a voice to the people who have alleged discrimination in housing. Um, and keep in mind that applies to rental, sales, lending, insurance. Um, it's just to, you know, make sure that people do have access to housing, which is very important and an ongoing issue. Thank you. So next, I think we're going to talk about what are some examples of discrimination in housing. And Kelly, we'll come back to you. Sure, so in my work um, running discrimination tests, we see different types of discrimination firsthand because our testers interact with housing providers, um, housing provider being an umbrella term that covers real estate brokers and agents, um, landlords, people who own property, property management companies of apartment buildings and the like. Um, and we see all sorts of different kinds of discrimination, um, but I will say that uh, usually we don't see um, these sort of very obvious statements, uh, especially when it comes to discrimination like race discrimination. It's rare these days, though not completely unheard of, for a housing provider to say something like, we don't accept people of X race. However, we do see discrimination in the form of um, worse customer service for people who are part of protected classes. Um, we see a lot of ghosting, so people who are part of protected classes never get calls back um, despite calling about housing. We see uh, subtle differences in how uh, people who are not part of protected class are treated, like they, be, they may be told about a red special that other people are not told about. Um, people who are pro in protected classes might not get told about how many units are available. Um, they might get told that there's no housing when there actually is housing available. So those kind of more subtle things that we're able to uncover through testing and uh, through getting evidence that way. Um, but we do see that typically um, it's more subtle. I will say the exception to that in my experience is that um, folks who have housing vouchers, also known as Section 8, but there are other types of vouchers, um, those folks often do get told straight out, we don't take vouchers, we don't do Section 8, that kind of thing, which is discriminatory in Massachusetts. Thank you. And Courtney, I think you were going to talk a little bit as well about some examples from discrimination in housing. Sure. Um, I completely agree with Kelly's point that more often than not, discrimination is not so overt. Um, but for the purposes of illustration, I'll just give a couple of examples where maybe it's more overt than it usually might occur in real life. Um, so one example would be a family is looking to rent an apartment and they appear to qualify for it. They can afford it. Um, but the landlord finds out they have young children and says he can't rent the apartment to a family with children because the apartment has lead paint. Um, so that's an example of discrimination based on familial status. Um, even though he has this reason, he doesn't want to do the lead paint abatement. That's not actually a lawful excuse to discriminate against a family with children. Um, another example is a family lives um, in an apartment complex and the family is an immigrant family and the tenants make a complaint to the landlord because there are repairs needed in the apartment. And the landlord responds that he knows they're not documented and he'll call ICE if they complain again or file a complaint with the city. Um, and that's actually something that I've heard a lot of examples of um, a lot of threats to call ICE. Um, and that is discrimination. Um, whether or not the family's documented does not matter. It's still discrimination. Um, the final example I'll give is a tenant living in a no pets building, recently um, got the opportunity to obtain a service dog. And she has a letter from her doctor saying that the dog is needed to help her with her activities of daily living. But the landlord says she can't have the dog because 
there's no pet rule and it's a strict rule and other tenants would complain. Um, that's an example of discrimination by refusing to accommodate a person with disabilities. Thank you very much. And we're gonna, before we move on to the next question, any, any other examples that people wanna share or we can discuss a little later as well? Yes, if I could just add that another thing to keep in mind is retaliation is also against the law. So, you know, if you file a complaint with the commission and then it's served on your landlord and then the next day you get an eviction notice because your landlord's annoyed that you're making them engage in this legal process, that is on top of the alleged discrimination, another legal issue. Um, and I think that's important for people to know that because there's often fear of, you know, reporting, um, you know, treatment of your landlord or your employer or other people because you're scared of losing your job or you're scared of being evicted during a pandemic. Um, but those, you know, you have rights to come forward to agencies that can help you and that's absolutely protected. I, I oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Rachel, thank you. Yeah. I agree. Um, I we also get uh, situations where um, you know people request an accommodation or a modification, um, you know, after they've been living there for some time, and then all of a sudden the landlord does does not want to renew the lease. Um, you know, like it was fine when they weren't requesting anything, but now that they have to actually make an accommodation. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, we're not re renewing the lease this time. So you know that's it's not, you know, they don't come right out and say that's why, but nobody had a problem renewing the lease before anybody requested anything. Thank you. I think those are all really, really helpful examples. Um, can we talk a little bit next about what resources are available if someone believes they may have been discriminated against? And we'll start with Kelly. So I touched on this a little bit in my introduction, but one place that you can uh, always call, again, whether you're in Cambridge or not, is HTTP because we do have our intake line. Um, but there are many fair housing organizations um, throughout the uh, state of Massachusetts that do similar work. Um, you know, so, some of our panelists are part of those organizations, so certainly reach out. Um, but in a more general sense, um, there is the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, also known as MCAD, um, you can also reach out to the Attorney General's office. Um, they generally are more focused on the federally protected classes, um, but you can still reach out to their office um, if you believe you've been discriminated against. Um, and even if you're not sure, if you you know just have a bad feeling, again, a lot of a lot of this discrimination is subtle to the point where it is difficult to know for sure. Um, don't hesitate to call most of our organizations for housing organizations. Um, we have the knowledge to be able to assess. Um, the different situations and point you in the right direction. So, you know, if you have uh, a feeling that you might have been discriminated against, or especially if something has been said to you that doesn't sound right, um, just please reach out to one of our organizations um, and we can point you in the right re direction or offer direct assistance. Thank you, Kelly. And Carolina? Sure. I know in my introduction, I talked about the work of the Human Rights Commission. Um, so, of course, we accept complaints against um, those who have committed discriminatory acts. Um, so just to go through the ways that you can file a complaint with us uh, online um, on our website, we have a fillable online intake form. Um, you can also send an email to our Human Rights Commission email address, which is hrc at cambridgema.gov. Or you could call our phone number, which is 617-349-4396. There's usually someone in the office every day that um, can answer a live call. Um, and we also are offering in-person appointments. Sorry, throughout. Carolina. This is the cart provider. Can you just repeat that phone number again? You're sure. going kind of quick. Absolutely. I apologize. Um, so our phone number is 617-349-4396. And that HRC email address was hrc at cambridgema.gov. And then, as I said, there's an online intake form um, where you just fill out with kind of what happened and just relevant facts that um, I would review before calling you to then conduct an intake. Um, and uh, I believe we're also offering in-person appointments through our online scheduling system. Um, and as Kelly said, 
you know, if we can't accept your complaint, you know, of course, if the discrimination didn't take place in Cambridge, and if it happened more than six months ago, uh, MCAD um, has a longer statute of limitations. I believe it's 300 days. Uh, the Attorney General's office um, does have an intake uh, team that looks at various complaints um, or legal services. So there's a lot of different avenues if you're not sure who to contact. As Kelly said, oftentimes people call not necessarily knowing if they want to file a complaint, but just trying to figure out, you know, if they have a discrimination complaint, if, you know, kind of what the best referral is, and we're happy to assist with that. Thank you, Carolina. So we will go next our, to our next topic, which is what are my basic rights as a tenant and are there resources available to learn more about those basic rights? We will start with Courtney. Sure. Um, so as has been well covered, you have the right as a tenant not to be discriminated against. And that is both in terms of as a prospective tenant when you're looking for housing and also while you're in housing. Um, and discrimination can be refusal to rent, refusal to provide reasonable accommodation, harassment based on being a member of a protected class or worse treatment, um, disparate treatment is what we call it based on your identity. Um, those are all examples of discrimination, which as we've talked about can be um, very overt in some situations or it can be very subtle. Um, aside from fair housing and discrimination, some basic rights that everyone should know about as a tenant, you have the right to live in a safe, habitable apartment consistent with the state sanitary code. Um, and that includes, for example, an environment free from vermin. You always should have heat, water, working appliances, no you know, big breaks or damage in your unit. Um, you have a right to that. You have the right to remain in your home unless and until a court orders your eviction after proper court procedures have been followed. That's another really important basic right that all tenants should know. Um, a landlord cannot just change the locks because they want to, they have to go to court and they have to get an order from a judge in order to evict you. So that's a really important thing to know, especially if you receive a notice or your landlord tells you you have to move out. There's a process and you have a right to that process. Another basic tenant right is the right to quiet enjoyment of your home without substantial disturbance. Um, so often that would include utility shutoffs, um, entry to your unit by your landlord without notice, um, excessive preventable noise during the late or early hours, all of those things that um, aren't necessarily repairs needed in your apartment, but really affect your ability to live comfortably in your home. Um, you have a right to quiet enjoyment in your apartment. Um, and finally, as Carolina mentioned earlier, you have the right not to be retaliated against for enforcing your rights. So that applies to fair housing. That also applies to your other basic rights. If you make a complaint with the city because your landlord's not making repairs, you have a right not to be retaliated against in that context as well. Um, and you have a right not to be retaliated against if you form a tenant unit, union or tenant association to try to enforce um, better living conditions. So those are all some, some examples of basic tenant rights outside of the fair housing context. Thank you, Courtney, that's so helpful. And um, Rachel, would you like to add to that? Well, that was very comprehensive. <laughs> um, so I don't have a lot to add to it, but I, I can say that, um, you know, you're, uh, in terms of uh, disability related rights, you may have you have a right to reasonable modifications. Uh, uh, to, sorry, to um, re reasonable modifications of 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 policy and or procedure. Like when we're talking about things like uh, service dog, pol uh, like like pet policies, and you have a service dog or an emotional support animal or um, something something like that. Um, you are um, you may also have the right to modifications of uh, the of the uh, of the actual uh, building, not the building, but like the your your home, your space, um, depending on what your needs are, and also that may be at your expense. So it depends on the situation. Um, you have the right not to be discriminated against for having a disability or for somebody thinking you have a disability. 
Um, I do want to say that people are welcome to call us with uh, to call us or email us with uh, questions about um, you know what the what their rights are even or their responsibilities or even you know just what does the law say about this particular situation or how have people handled XYZ kind of situation uh, in, in the past. Um, one thing, and there are, you know, we're available. There are also, um, all of the organizations that are represented here are available. Um, for those of you who are comfortable doing online research, there just about every, um, you know, enforcement organization has a webpage with, uh, technical assistance materials on it. They vary in how readable they are. Um, I say that because a lot of, you know, some of these uh, federal agencies are really fantastic at coming up with with laws and maybe not so great at explaining them in in, in English that people who don't do law for a living understand. Um, sometimes they do have materials available in languages other than in languages other than English. If you have questions about any of those things, that is what we're here for. We're here to help answer questions or try to clarify things. Um, you know, part of our living is translating between um, legalese and everybody else. Um, although we are not attorneys. And so that is something that we are happy to try to explain in any way we can. Also, something that is not going to be as useful to you is a lot of people think that they are going to find out about their housing rights by looking up information on the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, just so you know, the ADA does not cover private housing. So if you are dealing with a privately owned, you know, a landlord or private management company, that sort of th a thing, those are not situations that are covered under the ADA. That is specifically fair housing. So going to sites that cover the ADA specifically are not necessarily going to get you the information you want about that, although they may tell you lots of other great things. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you both very much. That was incredibly helpful. I want to remind our attendees that if you have questions you'd like for the panelists, to um, answer as we're going through this discussion, you can submit them through the Q&A feature in Zoom. So please don't, don't hesitate, don't be shy if you have any questions you'd like to submit. Um, our next topic is going to be, where can I go if I believe my rights as a tenant have been violated? And I think we've touched on this a little bit, but we'll, we'll come back more specifically. Uh, Carolina? Sure. Um, so generally, if you believe your rights as a tenant, not just with discrimination, but including discrimination have been violated, there are a lot of options. There's um, De Novo, Cambridge Legal, Cambridge Somerville Legal Services, Harvard Legal Aid, Disability Law Center. There's various um, mediation services if you just need assistance with you know, informally resolving an issue with the landlord um, and kind of finding a compromise. Um, as I've stated a few times, you know, if, if you're not sure what you need, you could just call us and we can help you figure it out. Um, I'll also say that the city of Cambridge, um, as I think Jennifer mentioned, we do have a housing liaison, Mara Penzak, who is a wonderful resource and she could help with any housing related questions um, specific to Cambridge. Um, so those are just some examples. There's, there's many more organizations that may be able to help um, if you just you know, need direction on where to go. I think any of the panelists here can help put, point you in the right direction. Thank you. And uh, Courtney? Sure, so we've covered a lot of the places that I would suggest going to. Um, I think a good start a lot of the time is either the housing liaison to the city manager or um, CEOC, which is a local anti-poverty organization. Um, those are great places to go if you're not really sure if your rights have been violated or what your needs are and you just want a resource to kind of figure out what your options are. Um, and they've also done amazing work informally resolving issues between landlords and tenants without the need for a formal complaint or a lawsuit. Um, so those are really great places to start. And then if things need to be escalated, um, complaining to the various government agencies we talked about, um, I think we've covered most of them, um, but if it's a repair issue, you can call the Inspectional Services Division of the City of Cambridge. They'll come out and inspect your apartment and issue violations if there are repairs needed. Um, and then the legal aid organizations Carolina mentioned are all organizations that may be able to help you as well. Um, and one other plug, um, sometimes 
The information on the internet is not the most reliable way to figure out your rights. Um, so I would caution people, um, you know, to take everything you find on the internet with a grain of salt, but a great resource to learn some basic information about tenant rights is masslegalhelp.org slash housing. Um, that, or that website is run by the legal aid community in Massachusetts. So it's reliable in my opinion and has a lot of great basic information taken out of you know, the legal jargon and into plain English. Um, so that would be also a good place to start if you're just trying to learn a little bit more on your own. Thank you. And I know we're, we're tossing a lot of um, a lot of resources out during this discussion. So I just want to remind everybody that this will be recorded and posted on the city's website. So you can refer back to it yourself or you can direct um, friends and family to it if they have questions and they're not sure where to start. And uh, we will have closed captioning on the video once it's posted. So you can get the correct title or close enough, very close to the title um, to actually do some do some digging if you're looking for that. Sometimes it's just hard to go quickly when we're, we're throwing a lot of information your way. So our next question is going to be, what resources are available for landlords or property managers or realtors, um, kind of non-tenants, but others involved in the housing process who want to better understand how to prevent potential allegations of discrimination or tenant rights violations? And we will start with Rachel and then op open it up to the group as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so if, if you're trying to, I mean, like everybody here has said, feel free to call these various agencies and ask questions because that's part of what we're here for. Um, my, my agency in particular is not here to file complaints. We are here to answer questions, but not everybody's question is disability related. So um, that's the first thing is that we don't just talk to people who um, are concerned that they may have been discriminated against. We also wanna to talk to people who wanna make sure they're doing the right thing. Um, or a situation has come up and they didn't know, right? They didn't know what their responsibilities were and they want to know what, what it is that they should be doing or are they completely off base here? Is the per, you know, because while some of the time, uh, some of the time the, um, it's that a, a landlord is in fact, you know, whether knowingly or not discriminating, sometimes a tenant is not entirely clear on what their rights are and are not. So, um, you know, all of us are here to help with with those those questions. But I think it is better to ask questions than it is to just sort of, you know, keep on going through and not be sure of what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And the reason why I say that is because you don't lose anything by asking questions. Right. We are not taking down. I mean, we may ask you your name so we can make sure you know look it up if we've talked to you before or something like uh, like that but we're not trying to we're not trying to like catch people right so you can call us up and ask us questions about what you're doing or what you would like to be doing and that does not get you in trouble all right we are not here to get people in trouble ideally what we're here to do is make sure the uh, is make sure that you know people are doing things that are in fact in compliance with the law and are in fact um, you know, not discriminating against people and in fact are welcoming of, of all kinds of people. So I think that's the first thing is don't be afraid to ask a question. Um, you may not get the answer you like, but we will give you an honest one. Um, and you are not, whatever it is you're calling about, you are not the first or the oddest to, to call us about whatever it is. Like you, you would have a lot of competition for any of those titles. So um, fear not. Um, also, if you are uh, also if you're a tenant, you can feel free to give our uh, to give our information to your landlord or to your management and say, look, you know, this is how I see it. But if you would like to talk to the folks that actually the, to folks that have the information and are supposed to give it out for a living, here are some phone numbers that you might be able to call. And they're not gonna, you know, I'm we're not gonna like come after people. Um, so that's thing one um, is that the more you know, the better shape you're gonna be in. Um, and also to make sure that um, sometimes, 
I, just like sometimes the internet doesn't always have all the most accurate stuff, sometimes the folks, and I say this as somebody who studied journalism myself, but a lot of the folks who are, who are covering these things in the media do not have a background in any of these things and have never, in, in a lot of cases, they don't know a lot of disability related stuff. They don't know a lot of discrimination related stuff. They don't know a lot of housing related stuff because that's not their job to know it. And so when you are reading about a thing that happened and you want to know if it applies to you or to your, you know, to your, the, your housing or anything like that, that's where you, that's where you can ask some questions. Um, so I think that's the first thing is don't be afraid of organizations that are there to give you information because you may as well have the information because I didn't know is not an excuse that holds up in any court around anti-discrimination stuff. Um, and um, I, I think I, th I think Kelly has a hand up, so I'm going to hush for a second. That's, thank you. You took care of it for me, Rachel. Kelly, we'll go to you. Thanks. I just wanted to add that uh, while HGTP at Suffolk does not represent uh, housing providers, we only represent complainants or people who think that they've been discriminated against. Um, we do partner with organizations because part of our miss mission is to try and prevent discrimination before it happens. Um, and in particular, we recently partnered with the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. Um, so we do work with real estate agents to train them and to basically make sure that they are informed when it comes to fair housing. Um, and if you are a realtor or you know a realtor or uh, any really a uh, housing provider, whether it be a realtor or a landlord um, who would like to learn more about fair housing, um, you can go to marealtor.com slash fair dash housing. So it's marealtor.com slash fair housing. Um, and it's an entire online portal that we help them create, which has a bunch of free resources about fair housing and uh, has a bunch of information about how to make sure that you're complying with the law and that you're treating everyone um, fairly when it comes to housing in particular. So I did want to point out that uh, particular resource because it has a lot of great um, information about that uh, on there. Thank you so much, Kelly. That's wonderful. Um, any other thoughts on the resources available for landlords or property managers? Okay, we will move to our last um, planned discussion topic, which is what are some general practices that make for a successful tenant and landlord relationship? We'll start with Carolina. Sure. Um, so what I would say uh, for some practices that make for a successful tenant landlord relationship, um, the first thing is to review the lease with your landlord. I think it's really important to understand what your lease says. Um, I think it's important to maintain awareness of what your rights are as a tenant. So all the rights that um, Courtney and the other panelists have gone through to, to know that you do have rights as a tenant. Um, and if a landlord does not um, comply with them, that you have rights to seek help. Um, I would also say, you know, set clear guidelines for communication. You know, if, um, if you need certain things such as, you know, bigger font uh, regarding your lease or communication just by email because, you know, it's just preferred communication method, I think trying to be clear with your landlord um, will make for a successful relationship. And if you're having issues to tell your landlord, sometimes with discrimination cases, for example, if you're being harassed by another neighbor um, for some reason, um, your landlord is required to try to take action to stop the harassment. Um, you know, you may have a, a case against that neighbor as well, but just, you know, oftentimes with different cases, if your landlord isn't aware that one, you need a reasonable accommodation, or modification or there's other issues, um, you know, then they can't take action to try to provide that for you. Um, so things like that, I would say would be um, important to keep in mind. Wonderful, thank you, Carolina and uh, Rachel. So one of the things that I, I tend to tell tenants in particular, but I, I, I tenants in particular to do is to document everything in writing not necessarily in an I'm gonna get you kind of way, but in a, you know, 
when you are going through a difficult situation and housing situations have extra stress att attached to them just because they 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 leak into everything about your life right because they're ha your housing so it's stressful it is really helpful to have written documentation in any way possible if you can um of what's going on when did you talk to this person what happened if you are having an email community if you have their email address or something like that um, following up with them with an email, we talked on X, Y, Z date where we discussed, you know, A, B, and C. And here is, you know, I'm just confirming that. And that will make your life easier. And also it leaves a paper trail. I feel like also for landlords and tenants, you know, try not to do, first of all, try not to do anything blatantly illegal. So definitely don't do that in writing. Um, but given that you are working to try to do the right thing here, as a, as a good faith practice, following, you know, if, if your tenant is, is following up with, um, you know, something in writing saying, yes, actually, that's correct. That's what we said, or no, that's not what we said. And getting that, uh, you know, getting that worked out, I think also shows, I feel a willingness to communicate. I think that the th it's important to keep in mind that everybody in this situation, in a situation, is at least a little stressed out about it. Nobody calls me about discrimination when they're having a good day, whether no matter which which end of the situation they're on, right? So um, it's important to remember that while under no circumstances do you need to put up with discrimination and you know, under no circumstances does anybody on either end of the, uh, this equation need to be put up with abuse, that everybody is working from a somewhat stressed out perspective here. Um, and it is important for, um, for landlords to know that they should probably educate themselves as much as possible. Landlords, management companies, if you have staff, please, please train your staff. Um, train your staff about all these things, about accommodations, about policies, about if you have somebody who is trying to, who wants to look, come look at an apartment, but they need an ASL interpreter or, you know, that sort of thing. Do you know what to do in that situation? If you have someone who calls via relay, which is a communication system for folks who are deaf or hard of hearing, do you know what to do in that situation? We're here to help. But the fact of the matter is the information is out there in a lot of places and there's nothing wrong with, you know, it is possible that you will not use that information. But the idea is that hopefully you will because your apartment or building or whatever will be open to everybody and people will know that and they will want to give you their money. Um, and with folks who are um, with, with tenants, keep in mind that you do have rights. Um, that the more you document what's going on, the better it is, that nobody has the right to go, and this is good, good for um, landlords to know, nobody has the right to go rummaging through anybody's medical files. So nobody needs to know all of any, anybody's personal medical details because we get a lot of calls about that from people who are like, they want all my medical files. Okay, you don't want all of anybody's medical files. The only time you want all of anybody's medical files is if you are their doctor. Um, so, you know, those are, or also confidentiality is really important things to keep in mind. And that sometimes there are conflicting access needs and people need to be able to work on that creatively. Um, and so those are things that I think are, are um, useful for, for keeping in mind, you know, how to, how to keep the landlord tenant relationship around these things as, as smooth as, as possible. And I just, for something just flew out of my head. So that, so clearly I'm not going to t uh, tell you about whatever that thing was. If it comes back to you, Rachel, we will come back to it. Um, does Thank anyone you. else have any, have any thoughts about some, some general practices for the successful tenant and landlord relationships? Okay, we that concludes our panel discussion portion that we had planned. So I know we have attendees. If they have, if you have any questions, you can still submit them. We have not received any right now, but I want to thank everyone for attending today and for um, 
and especially to our panelists for, for such a great discussion and answering such helpful questions. We will send um, a list of resources and information to the attendees who registered through the webinar. So keep an eye out for that. We will also, um, I'm sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. We will also have um, a survey actually for an optional survey for attendees in the chat function now. If you would like to complete that, it's a survey on some demographic information. Again, completely optional. You do not have to complete it, but it is available for you. And we encourage everyone to please stay involved in the Housing Cambridge program and campaign. Thank you so much. Thank you particularly to our panelists and thank you to Stephanie, our um, our CART, CART agent who is helping us as well today. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And again, please do stay involved with the Housing Cambridge campaign. Thank you so much.